going to let everyone in. Oh, and then uh, we'll come. take a breath and then we can start. Okay. All right. Cool. Sounds good. Thanks in advance. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having us. Ooh, we've got 25 out of the 30, which is impressive. Hi, everybody. Almost everybody's on board, so I think we're going to start momentarily. Welcome. I'm taking a peek to see if anyone's hanging in the, uh, the waiting room. And what you can do if you like is um, you can select gallery view or you can uh, select speaker view, whatever suits your women fancy. Okay, Mike Pfeiffer, are you there? I am here. Yay. Are you outside? Hello. Where are you? Um, oh, no, you're, we're, no, you're inside. <laughs> no, I'm inside. The Ryder Cup is on. So I'm watching the end of that. And mm. Terry's here. Hi, Terry. And we, we were going to sit outside, but we figured by the end it'd be too dark. So, no, good point. You know, so everyone, welcome. Um, I may actually not know everybody on uh, this tasting. So, um, this is uh, something completely different. And my name's Madeline, Madeline Trifon, and I'm the happy sommelier for uh, Plum Market. Uh, but today we're doing cider, uh, which is something that I had to sort of flash educate myself about, especially after I had the, uh, the joy of uh, visiting uh, 2K Farms up north a couple of weeks ago. And one of the reasons we're doing this, and we've been talking about it at Plum um, with the wine team leaders for some time, is a couple, three of our buyers have unbridled enthusiasm for cider. Uh, mm -hmm. Those of you who share that know that we have reasonably good sets of cider in our stores, particularly at West Bloomfield and Ann Arbor. And um, I figured if anyone was that excited about anything, you know, I should pay attention to it too. Uh, so I'm the one who was uh, woefully uneducated, but now am um, a happy enthusiast. Um, Great. When I visited um, uh, Northern Michigan a couple of weeks ago. Uh, my last stop was at uh, now 2K. Am I saying 2K Farm or 2K Farms, Max and uh, George? Farm. 2K Farm. Farms. Farm. 2K Farm. Singular. So see, I'm, I'm being... Uh, corrected already because I've been saying it, uh, incorrectly but I and I was actually late I had to call them a couple of times because I'd been sent on mm. I got on a wild goose chase I'd been sent to uh, a small grocery store where they had um, absolutely spectacular house-made uh, vegetarian Indian food so mm. <laughs> and you NJ knew where I was going food. too yeah and worth the side trip well, you man, I managed to lose myself in the Leelanau Peninsula, but when I finally <laughs> ended up at uh, uh, 2K Farm, it was a wonderful experience. And um, let me see if I can make this a little bit louder. I'm not going to tell you uh, all about cider uh, other than to set the stage that it is just to overstate the obvious for all of us. Um, it's an alcoholic beverage made from the fermented juice of apples. And... It, I am stunned at how many countries have evolved uh, cider cultures. You know, that um, when Max and I were chatting, um, what was revelatory to me is, and it makes sense, this is an historic beverage that goes back, it's an ancient beverage. So way before countries communicated with each other, their different uh, styles and production methods for ciders evolved uh independently right so whether you're talking about you know the famous cider production of the UK uh, England you know and uh, Ireland or whether you're talking about um the commonwealth countries like Canada and Australia Portugal you talked about Max the uh, the Mino right uh, mm -hmm. and Basque country and of course France Normandy uh Brittany but then you've got Piedmont and Friuli in Italy um and really everywhere. So today 
Um, we've got uh, the two brothers that own 2K. We have their winemaker and cider maker, Adam Satchwell, with us, who I've been lucky enough to know. We're going on at least a couple of decades, Adam, I think. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you remember, but I think I met you back in the mid-70s at the London Chop House. Oh, my. Yes. When I came I was... in with my father, who was writing a restaurant guide for Detroit. Oh, my. Um, and... Uh, there you were. I was the first, but not the last uh, sommelier at the London Chop House. Um, I was there from 85 to 90 and then went to go work for Jimmy Schmidt. And yeah. my, uh, my dear friend and master sommelier, Claudia Tiagi, uh, took over as the, uh, the sommelier at the London Chop House. And Claudia actually is um, far more adept at the entire subject of Michigan, everything, as she lived up north for... Uh, for many years, but I'm going to try to, to do a good job in her stead. So today we're going to talk about everything we can touch on in an hour. Um, you know, the styles ranging from dry to sweet, still to sparkling, um, really fascinating subject of the apples. You know, we're talking about a very special farm that the Costello zone, where they have, you know, over 30 kinds of heritage apples which are very different than modern, AKA culinary apples. Um, and please keep your questions. Nobody's gonna feel like, like the questions are silly. I know this, everyone always feels that wine questions are silly, but I don't feel cider questions are silly. I think they're uh, no. you can keep them coming in the chat room. You can, um, you can interrupt us occasionally. We're gonna taste everything ranging from um, rosé to a uh, sweet ice cider that everyone's excited about. And hopefully I'll get to ask a couple of um, nerd questions, uh, especially about, you know, things like malolactic or if I get around to it, Adam, I don't know. I'm just so fascinated by um, this whole subject. So yeah, please uh, do. everyone, if you could um, please give uh, a warm welcome to Adam and of course, Max and uh, uh, George Cascella, who are going to tell you about um, their apple estate, all estate fruit, which is thrilling, and um, a little bit about their own background because um, they um, they lived in Germany for a significant mm -hmm. number of time and are familiar with uh, cider production in Europe. So welcome, Max and George and Adam. We're thrilled to have you with us. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, Madeline. And should I show some cool pictures since we went to the trouble of putting them together? Why not, right? <laughs> right yeah. Right. Can We're everyone visual see people. this? Yep, I'm very visual. Everyone see this okay? Yes? Good. Yes, we yeah. Okay, now um, this is, we've still got people joining us. This is actually um, a very popular uh, tasting we're doing because everyone who has signed up is coming on board. And that's never the case with wine tastings. I usually miss around 20%. So yay. Oh, and by the way, most importantly, cheers to everyone, to your good yeah, health in these ongoing, extraordinary times we're living in. Yes. Uh, so here's to uh, all beverages that are delicious, impeccably made, and especially from Michigan fruit. What could be better than that? Um, so here mm. we are. Mm. And per usual, there's no cider police. All y'all can taste everything at your own pace. And then here we are. What are we looking at? We're looking at the Leland Peninsula, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Are, yes. And there's your farm, which is hailing distance uh, from the bay. Right next to the bay. Right next to the bay off M22. Wow, isn't that beautiful? Um, and I was there exactly two weeks ago, uh, sitting on uh, outside with these guys and tasting, uh, boy, God, at least uh, half a dozen, if not more, ciders. By the way, I didn't put the order in which we're going to taste these. And I know um, Robin and uh, Norm, especially, you always like to have that. So we're going to taste the uh, Spitzenberg, followed by the Rosé, followed by the Old World, and then finish up with the, uh, the ice cider. So Spitzenberg, Rosé, um, Old World, and Ice Cider. Unless I screwed it up, we're doing the Rosé first. We're going to find out momentarily. Mm. Tell me about who took this shot? I did. 
I think that I think this is a great picture. It just shows you exactly where we are, and one of the reasons why we can grow this fruit is because of that water right there. Absolutely, mm. our maritime climate. And what does that mean as far as apples go? Because you know we talk about it a lot with wine. Sure. You want to touch on that? Sure. So the reason why Northern Michigan, specifically on the west side by Lake Michigan, is so special. Um, we do get warm days and then cool nights. So what that does, like with, gra with grapes, we get great uh, um, flavor development, you know, sugars, uh, sugars uh, flavonoids, all those good, good things that we like in wine and cider. Um, and we also get an extra hour of sunlight. So we get a little extra ripening, which can add to sugars, um, just better fruit development. Um, it's a, very special place um and if we didn't have this water it would be 10 degrees cooler or colder in the winter and we'd be like alpina almost the same be, climate yeah so the lake effect applies to apples as much as it does uh any, to fruit. Yep. Any, any fruit any fruit any fruit yep. so do any of you want to do give us the short version of what the hell the lake effect is because it impacts both ends of the growing season right sure yeah Yep. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give this one a shot. So um, in the early part of the season, um, the temperature of the water helps moderate air temperatures, um, you know, all sorts of things. I mean, you know, down to, you know, the way the winds move through the area, um, but it's a big temperature moderator. So what it does is um, delay butt break um, and the initial growth phases um, until you're past most threats of frost. That's beautifully so, said and yep, very so, simple. Yep. So it so it protects us in the spring mm -hmm. and in the summer or in the summer. I mean, it collects heat and radiates heat, um, and same with the fall. Um, it allows for a longer prolonged uh, growing season and just moderates it. Um, takes a lot of the, the, the highs and the, the lows out of it, um, but we still get you know, plenty of warm days for ripening um, and lots of cool nights for you know, good acid retention and just you know, flavor development and all those great nuances. Perfectly said. So apples, like you know, when you have the diurnal swings between daytime and nighttime temps, yep. that preserves the acidity in apples just the way it does in grapes. Absolutely. Cool, good to know. And then uh, this next shot I love because, oh, this is something that Max sent me. Maybe you guys can tell us what we're looking at and a little bit about uh, the history of this special, special farm. Yeah. So this is a video I took this past spring during bloom. And you can see the different stages of bloom. So each variety blooms at a different time. Um, but this is our main orchard where we have around 20,000 trees uh, in production. And we have roughly 22,000 trees in total in production. Um, but uh, this orchard was planted over several years uh, from 14, 15 to uh, 2019, we plant 2,000 trees. And next year, we anticipate planting another 2,000, if not 3,000 trees. And how uh, many acres do you have? 80 acres, but I would say 22 acres of apples that are in production currently, currently and about seven, seven and a half of grapes, vinifera. And yeah, we're at the end. We're going to talk about the uh, a little bit about the wine. Or Adam will not forgive me, and I have to say, <laughs> I don't forget that I That's tasted a right. You don't want to neglect the wine. <laughs> cider is wine, technically. Yeah. There may not be cider police, but there is wine police here. So ah. Wine police, yes. But so you, your, your farm is 80 acres, and it was part an original what 400 acre farm, <clears throat> incredibly historic. Yeah, the Lee family. So. Uh, Robert Lee, uh, not <laughs> not related to the general uh, from the south, but he got um, originally our farm is on the 160 acres that he uh, received for service in the Civil War, and then they homestead. yeah their homestead uh, farm, and then they purchased more land 
as generations. Uh, but this is the last uh, parcel. This was the original homestead. You can see the barn right there. That's over a hundred oh, years old. This one right here is the original. Red barn. Yes, yep. right yeah, there. The red that, barn. Very cool. Yeah. And now you guys were well, you guys were raised at least part of your uh, formative years in Germany. How did you end up doing this? Can you give us a short version of how you came to own this farm? <laughs> I don't know if there's just a straight answer, but many, <laughs> many things that kind of came together. But, you know, we've been coming up here to uh, Northwest Michigan for as a family for yeah. 20 years now. I, I, we also have a uh, uh, family in the Onekama Manistee area. Which is um, south of here. South, just south, south of here. And they've been up here for 100, 120 years. So we have roots up here. But this uh, property uh, uh, went out in the market in 2010, and that's when we purchased it. And instead of going the easy route and buying the fruit, we did the hard route and started planting these heritage apples in 2012. Well, but also based on our research, Absolutely. knowing that, you know, like wine grapes, cider apples make the best cider. Um, so that's why we focused on cider specifically. So what's the difference apples between a cider apple and like a culinary or a regular apple? So a culinary apple will not have the tannin and the acids like uh, a cider apple will have. Um, it's kind of just uh, basic, you know, your basic apple, Granny Smith, Gala. Um, they're sweet, you know, but there's not a lot going on other than there's that. no nuance i mean yeah. speaking of you know the uh, the spitzenberg you know these these flavors of passion fruit and uh, grapefruit that come through fermentation there's nothing like that in a, a red delicious unfortunately so, so you have more you actually have more complex aromatics right I absolutely. Mean, absolutely and flavors and flavors yeah. but so also do you, have, do you have more tannin too you have uh because tannin figures in variety in absolutely apples. yeah the the, the tannin structures of is a little different than um, with wine grapes, just the, the nature of the tannins and, um, you know, getting into, you know, the, the length of the chain of the molecule and things like that. Um, but an interesting point is um, when I started working with apples, discovered that apples um, contain uh, many more esters, which is a very aromatic compound. Yeah. Um, which expresses during fermentation. Um, apples have a lot more esters than grapes do. No kidding. A, a lot more. I wow. mean, significantly more. That had to make you happy because you weren't going to yeah. get bored making cider. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, I had to show this, by the way. And Max told me now the tasting room is, you know, uh, decorated with beautiful artwork <laughs> as well. But I just love you guys, like, did this uh recently correct within the last actually we just years. had our three-year anniversary on the 21st it's so. just a glorious tasting room it really is i really enjoyed it and there i was sitting in that table with right you there. on the patio and, panoramic uh, views the bay and the orchard mm -hmm. yeah and uh i took this this i had to show at least a couple pictures i took myself because i was proud but we're looking at high density planning is that mm -hmm. is that something that's common for um Apple trees, because it's definitely talked about with uh, with vines, with wine vines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so high density, this is the future of apple farming. Most new farms that are producing apples, they're in this fashion of 1,100 to 1,200 trees per acre. So it is high intense, high density. Uh, and you can see these are smaller trees called dwarf apple trees. Um, but it's it's a, it's actually very new to the cider world because most of the orchards and production for cider are using freestanding free trees at a much uh, larger spacing, six foot if not eight foot spacing. So this is very innovative in my view of cider apples growing them uh, in this fashion. Developed in Italy you know, about 15, 20 years ago. Um, oh, so it's cutting edge. Uh... Yeah, this is this is cutting edge stuff. Yeah. This is... Yeah, and what you can't really see because of all the foliage is the trellis system um, that runs along the rows well, you there. You know, yeah, much like, you know, right. much yep. like with, uh, so you're training. Uh, a fruiting, a fruiting yep. wall. Yep. Yep. Very cool. Now, uh, everyone, by the way, please start sipping, you know, either the rosé or the Spitzenberg or both. I'm, I'm going uh, 
side by side with them. And I have to tell you, the first word that occurs to me is drum roll dangerous because I cannot perceive the alcohol in these ciders. So ah. I can really see um, they're so perfectly balanced that you could get yourself in trouble if you start thinking it's lemonade, you know? <laughs> There's a technical term that I like to use for these ciders and that's uh, slurpable. Slurpable. Ah. <laughs> but they are, you know, also they everyone- They easy. If you look at the back of labels, they're glorious, uh, by the way, packaging. And these are all slightly smaller than a half bottle, correct? Uh, 12 fluid ounces as opposed yeah. to 12 and a half. Yeah. But um, if you look at the back, you're actually using a version of the Riesling scale in terms of dryness on the back, yep. which I really think is brilliant because people are always wondering, is it sweet? Is it dry? What is it, right? right. Well, there you have it. And the ice cider is the volume's all the way up. Uh, yes. So Let's turn it all tell the way. us about this, because this is very, very important, this, um, this picture we're looking at. What is this? So this is uh, all modern uh, commercially grown trees use what's called a rootstock. And that's what you see right here. That's the undergrowth of the tree. It determines, you know, how precocious, how much fruit it produces, disease resistance, how big it gets. Um, but we actually graft uh, our apple trees on the farm. So that's why we say graft to glass. So we propagate the trees on the farm and really this we did out of necessity because we couldn't source all these cider apples uh, throughout the country. So we had to start grafting our own trees so we could produce them in house um, because there was a waiting list of four nursery. to five years with these nurseries. And we don't want to wait that long. So, yeah. um, and also it just gives us more control on what varieties we can plant. And um, again, some work out, some don't. So uh, grafting is really uh really unique uh, with 2K here. Now you, um, there's a question that actually just came in from Dave that I think I can answer from your tech sheets asking about residual sugar. And we're yeah. talking about um, on the, 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 um, the Spitzenberg and the Rosé, we're talking under 2% um, yeah. RS, right? Uh, under yeah. one and a half percent actually. So it's really cool. And I think is the information on the back label as well. It's, it's more of an indicator, yeah. so, you it's know. It's an indicator, you know, but it is on the check sheet. Like, if you go to yeah. the website, you can see um, that information. So is there any other farm that you know of that has as many heritage, heritage apples as you do? Not a commercial, no, not, not what we're doing, no. Um, Kilt, there is an orchard called Kilcherman's up in Northport, uh, Christmas Cove. Uh, he had... A quite a um, quite a selection, selection. but the commercial uh, basis like this with uh, thousands of trees per yeah. variety, mm -hmm. again in a high density, high intense fashion. I I don't know of any farm in the Midwest, and we uh, yeah, M Michigan State said that we are one of the largest high density um, orchards that grow cider specific apples in the Midwest. Bravo to you! How cool is that? So you. Yeah. You're, you can be compared with um, complex operations on the East Coast as well, correct? Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I think in the Midwest, we're, we're a little bit lagging behind the, the, the cider. Yeah. Uh, let's call it the cider revival because, you know, cider is not new to this country, but, uh, you know, growing these apples is uh, new to, I would say, the last 20 years or so. Mm -hmm. Um, but prohibition, they tore out a lot of these trees. But uh, yeah, so the East Coast are definitely ahead of the Midwest. And West Coast. And West so Coast. prohibition, the trees were um, uprooted so that people could not make an alcoholic beverage. Out not of like this. Well, yeah, they tore them out because there's no use for them. They're not, cult, you know, they're not eat not for eating. So they, don't, they don't actually taste very good. Um, a lot of these apples that we grow, we call them spitters because you bite into them. <laughs> they're very straight. They got a lot of acid, a lot of tannin, and they're I not that, very. Yes. Mm -hmm. I like it, but you know, yeah. if, if you're used to a honey crisp, uh, it's going to be you're not going to like experience an for you. So, yeah. So this is this. If everyone wants to start sipping on um, the rosé, what's really cool about this, and I did give you the wrong order initially, so it is. Um, we're doing the the pink uh, cider first. This color is utterly natural. This is a red fleshed apple. And 
George, tell us about Otterson, because this is a very special red apple. Yeah, so and red Otterson, flesh, red flesh, right? Yes, red flesh. So Otterson was developed by Michigan State down at the uh, Clarksville Research Center, um, and I actually took the cuttings from Clarksville in the winter of 2014 to 15, um, and we grafted those trees in the spring of 15, and that's what you're looking at uh, an Otterson apple. Um, it was originally developed for uh, cancer, um, uh, anti. Uh, Okay. Antioxidant use because uh, red apples have high antioxidant um, characteristics. So that's what it was originally bred for medicinal use. Um, but we found it has such a great color. Yeah. Um, and we don't use any added, you know, dyes or anything in our rose. It's all natural. So this apple just really. Um, it provides a lot of the color. Lot of color. Then we also have the, the pink pearl. So a little bit less uh, red flesh or more of a pink hue. So it's a blend of pink to red flesh varieties. And that's why it's a, a true, true cider rosé. You're going to see, by the way, a little video um, uh, towards the end of uh, this uh, uh, rosé cider being made. And I got to tell you, I mean, Adam, is it OK for me to swirl the glass? I don't know if there's like oh, yeah, cider etiquette, you know, uh, yeah. but I'm inclined to release yeah. the fragrance just the way I would with wine. And I would do this with champagne or anything, um, you know, that was sparkling because um, hell, the champagne guys like to dissipate the bubbles so they can pay attention mm -hmm. to the flavor and the fragrance. But this to me, you describe it as honeysuckle and watermelon. And I just think that's uh, dead on the money. But what strikes me about it is the delicacy of it. There's nothing, it makes me pay attention to it. This just the way um, a delicate uh, white wine would. Well, we, um, to, to, to expand on that note a little bit, we entered um, the rosé into the Jefferson Cup wine competition, mm -hmm. which is one of the more prestigious wine competitions in this country. <clears throat> and um, fortunately we won their top award in the sparkling category. Uh, for the rosé, and I got a call from one of the judges sat on the panel for this, and he said everybody was just flabbergasted. They didn't realize it was cider. What did they, they were was? they they were judging this as a really interesting rosé sparkling wine, <laughs> um, and they had they had no idea that you know this was was made from apples um, until after the fact. So um that had to make you giggle oh uh, yeah absolutely absolutely mm -hmm. you know and, and it's what i'm after you know i you know i want it to taste you know of of what it is and these unique apples and you know this is an experience with these apples that not many people have had so they don't know what to expect and you know to to you know hear people make these kind of comparisons you know yeah it's very cool i have to tell you in tasting it like wine the acidity is cleansing, but it's not annoying. I mm. barely taste the alcohol, so I said dangerous. Ah, but you know what's striking me? It's very long. You know, the, the flavor really persists. And that to me is a mark of quality in wine. Does anyone besides us want um, to jump in here if you're paying attention to um, uh, the rosé? Is anyone else sipping on the rosé that wants to... Um, talk about how they're perceiving it or what maybe what kind of food you would do with it. I went on, by the way, a website. I have to share this because, you know, I was possessed trying to think of what goes with what and why. And I tripped over a website um, that is called Cider Culture. You guys undoubtedly yep. know about this. Yep. And um, they had like a couple of pages beautifully written of something called a no sweat guide to pairings. And the principles were exactly the same as uh, with wine. You know, tart cider, tart food, tart cider, rich food, just slice through it, slightly sweet ciders, you know, sweet edged foods. Um, so we just use our common sense or just not worry about it whatsoever. And one of the recommendations they made was drinking rose cider with duck, like Peking duck. I like that idea. I like that idea, yeah. Anyone of uh, my team drinking the rosé besides me? Ah. By the way, uh, there, Phil, everyone say hi to Phil Lanuti, who uh, buys these ciders for Ann Arbor hey, West. Phil. With his Thanks. beloved Vicky. George, I don't do that. 
No, I don't think you met George. I don't Floyd. think we've met. Oh, hi, nice to meet you Thank virtually. You. <laughs> and Adam, I, you Adam, look, you look familiar. I think we probably met at some point. I'm sure we have cross paths. I've been around a little bit longer than I probably should have been. So, no, uh, all of us. Sure. Uh, no, there's no such thing. I'm going to be around <laughs> forever, you know, <laughs> because I like talking about all things wine and now cider and Michigan. And I'm going to embarrass our friend Michael Timpa, who's uh, around here somewhere, just because it was his enthusiasm that really fueled me to do this. And when you look at the cool little six pack that you got that was put together as twosies, this was Michael's brainchild to make That's it easy right. for you, as opposed to having to buy a six pack of all of the ciders, we split them up. So you got Great. two, two and two. So Michael, thank you for that. And thank you for um, turning me personally on to uh, 2K. So Mike I Pfeiffer think- and, uh, and Phil had a lot to do with that as well. I bounced mm-hmm. that off him and he, was, he said, absolutely. That's what mm-hmm. you want to do. What was the first cider you tasted, Michael, that really rang your bell? Or was it just seeing the farm that was the revelation? That's what it was, going to the farm. And uh, I didn't want to make it a big deal. So I didn't really let Max know that I was coming up. And that was a mistake. <laughs> I behind him in my uh, rental car. And I stopped and I'm looking at him while well, he's on the tractor. I was like, hey, Max. He's like, who the heck is this guy? <laughs> and uh, I had Minnesota plates, and uh, I was like, what, what's the deal? Uh, but he took the time, showed me all around, uh, just telling me, really, he was eating the apples. You were saying they're spitting apples. Uh, I loved them. Uh, he just kept tossing them, like, try this one and this <laughs> one. And uh, I kept trying to he- eat the entire apple until he was kind of like, Mike, you don't have to eat the entire thing, man. <laughs> Like, I'm trying to eat like seven apples at a time. Yeah. And he's like, calm down. Just chuck it off to the side and taste another one. And uh, that whole experience was, uh, was, was amazing. And I was up there with my girlfriend who, who fell in love with it as well. I can't open the ice cider tonight because I have to wait for her, apparently. Because she, uh, <laughs> she was really bummed. Uh, she's at a wedding rehearsal, so she couldn't make it tonight. But uh, she was kind of bummed out that she couldn't. So. Well, uh, Celine is a, 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 an adept pastry chef. So I can well imagine that if you have the ice cider without her company, she will not be happy with you. But <laughs> honest to God, it just occurred to me, you got a chance to taste the apples. How often do I get to taste wine grapes off the vine? I mean, Adam, seriously, I can't remember the last time I got a chance to do that. So um yeah, and go into a vineyard with 30 different grape varieties, mm-hmm. um, you know, that you can taste and, and you know, the whole range of, of fruit chemistry. <clears throat> that doesn't happen often. Nope. So I thank you, Mr. Tempa, for your bridled enthusiasm because that's why we're here. And this was the one I wanted to tell you about after visiting uh, the farm, because this, well, you guys tell me about this. It has something to do with Thomas Jefferson, this apple, yes? Yes, so Thomas Jefferson grew Espa Spitzenberg um, at his farm in Monticello. I believe there's still some Espa Spitzenberg trees there. Um, It's a great variety, Espa's New York. That's where it's from originally. this this apple variety i like eating it straight but it's um the juice that came from it just uh we were like wow light bulb we got to make a single varietal out of this um and i'm happy that we that we all thought it was worthy because i um, think adam can talk about the chemistry and why he chose i guess right this as a single varietal well i'll I'll, I'll quickly touch on the story that i i tell often and some people are getting tired of hearing it when i first came on to to work with acoscal is at 2k um you know we're talking about all these different apple varieties and we were all curious what they would taste like and i kept on hearing from the family you know so what's this going to taste like when we make it what's this going to taste like and my stock answer was meh i don't know you know we're going to find out um, because nobody's really, you know, working with these and certainly not in this climate. Um, so, you know, you can make Riesling in Australia, but that's not the same as making Riesling in Michigan. Um, it's going to taste different. 
but with uh, with Spitzenberg in particular, I remember when we pressed um, a batch of this, and I'm uh, you know working with the the juice, getting it ready for fermentation, and I'm smelling this, and I'm going, I'm recognizing some things in here, and I'm wondering if it's what I think it is, um, and what what I was smelling was juice that smelled amazingly similar to Sauvignon Blanc juice. Huh. And I'm going, well, you know, I, I know, you know, there are a lot of esters and, and, and apples. What about thiols, which is one of the, the, the big um, aromatic compounds in grapes when you, you know, talk about Sauvignon Blanc. It's, you know, it gives it that all, you know, that grapefruit and passion fruit. And, you know, you'll get them in Riesling. So it's a highly aromatic compound. So I said, okay, I'm going to ferment this like I was fermenting Sauvignon Blanc. And lo and behold, out the other side came the cider that smelled like pink grapefruit and passion fruit. <laughs> and I loved going around before it was carbonated and putting it in front of wine people. I'd put a sample in the glass and go, tell me what wine this is. And they'd <laughs> sniff at it and they go, oh, well, that's obvious. It's Sauvignon Blanc. <laughs> over and over and over again. Um, so, you know, it was this, this great discovery, um, which is still going on, you know, learning what these apples are capable of and finding ways to unlock um, these flavors. So, you know, to me, the Spitz, it's got a lot of similarity to Sauvignon Blanc. It's got that pink grapefruit. It's got some passion fruit. It's got that bracing acidity that yeah. now we know what to call it. We're going to call it Spitz. So we're going to use uh, sure. its nickname but you know what occurs to me while you're talking? First of all, everybody rub your tongue against the roof of your mouth. There's a little bit of tan in there, but really pleasant, like finely grained tannin. And the acidity is mouthwatering, but to the point where I want to eat something like cheesy. So I keep thinking like fondue, you know, um, something that would be really, uh, that needs the refreshing aspect of uh, this cider. Or another thing that occurs to me is Asian cuisine, especially a Japanese um, array of uh, both, you know, um, maybe some deep fried yummies uh, with the dipping sauce that's hot and some sushi where you're playing off heat and you're playing off sweetness and you need that acidity uh, to be refreshing. Do you like those ideas or do you have a better one? Uh, no, I'm, glad to, I'm getting hungry. So <laughs> ah. I'm doing when we're done here. Um, no, I, no, I think you're absolutely right. Um, there are a lot of similarities in the pairings um, when you when you look at wine. Um, the tannin structure is a little bit different, but the tannins are there. The acid structure is a little bit different. Apples have malic acid. Grapes, they're primarily tartaric acid, mm -hmm. but there's fruit acid. Um, one of the big differences is that it's low alcohol compared to wine. And, you know, uh, malic, by the way, Everyone, we've all heard of malolactic, the conversion of malic acid into lactic acid. I get to show off my street Greek, but milo is apple in Greek. So that's where the derivation of um, uh, malic acid uh, comes from. You know what strikes me too, is that much like Riesling, um, the acidity in these ciders can soak up residual sugar because it really doesn't taste sweet. You just have this illusion of sweetness mid palate just the way a dry Riesling um, will be. I've got a whole slew of other apples for us to flip through. Can you guys take turns telling us uh, about yeah, these? Yeah. Kingston Black, you said, Max, was super important, right? Yeah, it's. I guess you could almost call it the king of apples because it just has the, they say, the perfect balance of acid, sweetness, and tannin. So it's a renowned English cider apple and it's uh, one of those varieties that you can make a single varietal because of those properties, but it's a very rare apple. And I, I don't know. as far as I know, I think we're the only commercial grower and producer of Kingston Black in Michigan, if not the Midwest. Yeah. So I, I think it's a very unique uh, apple to um, our cidery. So is everyone yeah. getting that, that we have single varietal uh, ciders, but then we have blended ciders. So you don't see the the names mm -hmm. of the apples on the rosé, but if you go to the website, it will give you the four red fleshed apples they're made out of. You know what just struck me? Looking at these bins, they can be deep because the apples, unlike grapes, where you're always harvesting them in yep. very um, uh, shallow bins because you don't mm -hmm. want the grapes to crush 
Each yep. other, right. You don't have to worry about that with apples, right? Not as much. No, nope. um, just the way the physiology of the apple, yeah, the okay. structure, it, it holds up much better under pressures and yeah. Yeah, one, one of the big differences in cider production and, and, and wine production um, is that often we'll do what's called sweating the apples. Mm. So we put them into a temperature controlled um, environment. And, like cool, um, a cool house? Yeah, 45, 50 yeah. degrees. Um, and they develop flavors and um, they start going under, start undergoing certain chemical changes during this time. Almost like an internal fermentation. That's exactly what yeah. it is. Um, so you've got some 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 modification of the compounds mm -hmm. within the apples and some significant flavor development in a lot of these. Um, some of the apples are better pressed right away. You want that freshness and that brightness to them. Some of them you want to you know to build those other flavors and and build the depth. Um, so, which you know what you don't want to do with grapes. You don't want to pick your grapes and then put them in a warehouse for three weeks. No. Probably not a good thing. <laughs> These are gorgeous. That's a Wicks and Crab Apple. Um, we like, that's in the brandy, right? Yeah, uh, uh, yep, the, yep, there's the some in the brandy products. and used it in, in mm -hmm. other ciders too. Yeah, that was, um, oh, that's a big problem. So aren't crab apples, so I was trying to get that rid of really <laughs> what, um, the uh, it's, it's very important in British yeah, cider production. I think somebody needs yeah. to, somebody needs to uh, mute. We got uh, a little bit <laughs> of go back to the original going. Link we had. Everyone, take a look at your uh, at your audio and make sure you're muted, or you can unmute to uh, yeah. you know uh, uh, pipe up or ask a question. But crab apples are um, are an important component, as are uh, what uh, bittersweets. They, yes, they can, they're bittersweet, yeah. So they've got that, um, the sharpness of, uh, they've got tannin, but they've also got sugar. So um, yeah, they're really so interesting. So there really are, are four types of apples, especially cider apples, bittersweets, like bitter George sugar. said, um, high tannin, high sugar, bitter sharps, like the Kingston Black. Um, so bittersweet high, and bitter sharp. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And then there's sharps, Sharp. just high okay. acidity, no tannins, and then there's no sweets. Um, those could be some of your culinary apples, just like Gala's or Honeycrisp. Um, but uh, typically, yeah, you need a blend of those types of apples to make a a, a balanced cider. Mm -hmm. But again, these single varietal ciders kind of um, are the outliers. I I would say. There's a really cool question from Corey. How do you arrive at the particular residual sugar for each cider? Is it when the yeast stops or do you arrest fermentation and back sweeten? That's, well, is that a, that's an uh, Adam question? That's, that's a me question, I guess. Uh, um, well, I, uh, I'll say, um, what is this? This is my 46th year in the wine business and the, the adult beverage business. Mm -hmm. So I've been at this for a while and I've, I've made a couple of batches of of, uh, of wine and, and cider now. Um, and what I've definitely done is stop looking at the numbers. Uh, um, I certainly, you know, look at the, you know, the, the sugar numbers and acids and everything when the fruit comes in. Um, and I watch the fermentation to see how it's progressing. So, you know, I'm looking at those numbers, but when it comes to finishing the cider, um, I try to ignore the numbers as much as possible. Um, it's strictly a matter of taste. Um, where do I like it? Where's that balance? And I'm looking for, and balance is one of those funny words that can be kind of overused and misused. But to me, it's very specific. I mean, it's the interplay of, of alcohol, acid, sugar, you know, tannins, all those things that, you know, that, that play together um, within the beverage. Um, and I'm looking for them all to play nicely and not one stand out um, and, you know, everything complement each other. So it's, it's, it's a matter of taste. Now, do you, um, let, if you let the cider ferment dry and then do you back um, or do you stop? Um, I do both. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll stop the fermentation 
Um, sometimes I will ferment it dry, um, which gives you a whole different, you know, um, you know, element of, of the balance there. And then back sweeten with fresh juice. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll do both. Um, Cool. You know, it depends. Sometimes I will do both with the same cider. Um, so, you know, it just, it depends on, you know, I don't know, it becomes kind of a Zen kind of thing. Yeah, you, know, you just know where it's going. After, 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 it's pouring, going. after X number of harvests, you get to be Zen. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. So tell me, are, are there anything we need to know about any of these? Wixom, we talked about, Dabinet, uh, Ashley's Kernel. I guess the Dabinet is... Uh, one of the primary apples in the old world so it's a, a english bittersweet apple mm -hmm. it's a prolific uh bear so it bears a lot of fruits um but it's a astringent it's got high tannin uh so that's a pure cider apple and these and flowers no appear at what point uh they bloom at different times uh i would say uh, june early june well may to june may to june yeah. mm -hmm. may to june and you're, yeah. you're about to harvest, you're harvesting apples now. Can Currently, you know? we started last week. Yeah, um, yeah we just harvest wine, just so you, you don't get bored. You know, <laughs> you're doing, uh, you're doing um, grape harvest and apple harvest. And yeah. yep. um, I want to push us along so we can taste the, uh, the old world, because this is a, we're really pivoting away from the rosé and the, um, and the spits because we've got what 20 plus uh english and french cider apples with this baby yes. yep so that's why we named it old world they you know the old world is where people from europe that came to north america that's what the old world right um so and that's where these apples originated from england and france um so that's kind of the history of and that thing stylistic too it's a drier cider as opposed to some of these more american style it's called american style ciders that are sweeter the sweeter i guess american palate and by the way everyone and i have to say i think i was right we were originally going to do this like wine as the driest one first but i thought it would be friendlier to do the slightly softer ciders first and then ease into this because this has a little more tannin it's got a little more grip yeah, yeah, definitely. It definitely shows the tan in there, and it is it's dry. It's bone dry. Mm -hmm. um, so you know the only sugar in there are the unfermentable sugars. You know, it's like a tenth of one percent residual. Well, on you know what? I got to tell you, that's this as is dry as dry gets. This is thrilling. Looking at the stats, because it's it says two grams per liter. I remember um, an artisan champagne producer telling me definitively. It's impossible to have a brut nature with no residual sugar that it usually stops at two grams per liter because those yeah. are the unfermentable sugars. Right, so right. You're doing, uh, you're doing artisan champagne work here. With, <laughs> That's uh, right. And what, I, what, what I really like about this cider um, mm -hmm. is that it expresses a lot of those, um, what I refer to as other flavors and aromas. Um, there's a lot in there that, to me, um, doesn't remind me of, you know, standing in the, the apple section of, of Meyer. You know, there's not a lot of apple-y kind of, play. there's other stuff going on. There's hay, and there's me, smoke, and there's, smoke and there's, you know, all sorts of cool stuff going on. The tan and, um, you know, and there's apple in there, um, but those aren't the primary flavors, um, I, I, think think just, I think there's an herb thing. I think that yep. there's, I think that there's citrus skin, you know, like uh, lime zest, lemon yep. zest. I think that it's both dried and fresh herbs. Um, I find it really fascinating and I'm dying for something crunchy, uh, salty and fatty, so like a perfect uh, French fry oh, or uh, something like that. Mike and Mike, are either of you uh, yeah. tasting this? Does anybody? Besides me, want to describe what you're perceiving because I think it's a pretty killer dry cider. I get smoke for sure in a good way. Um, or perhaps earthy tones. Yeah, it's just so crisp, so clean and refreshing. You know what? I also get like a salinity. 
you know, like um, almost a saltiness. I mean, I know we're, you know, in freshwater land, we're not next to the Pacific or the Atlantic, mm -hmm. but um, there's a little bit of a savory uh, character to this, uh, this cider. I almost said wine, because I get that in wine sometimes from like Muscadet or, mm -hmm. um, uh, wines like that. Carrie, you're sitting there. You you are always. I am <laughs> sitting here. Come on, um, everyone know Carrie Pfeiffer. She's uh, <laughs> very eloquent when it comes to her descriptions. <laughs> well, and we loved visiting you guys last fall, by the way. And uh, they thank do you. taste better out thank of you. the uh, <laughs> swag. Yes, thank you. Fully indoctrinated. Thank you. Uh -huh. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> No, actually, there's actually a bit of phenolic bitterness in this, which I really appreciate. There's almost like a radicchio or an IPA quality to it, which is pretty cool. Um, I like that it's an old world style, a little bit closer to that, you know, kind of funky Spanish thing, more than like more like a chocolatey or something like a Basque cider yep. um, with that kind of bright acidity, but without the kind of skunkiness you sometimes can get from even like British ciders. I just think it's a really well balanced. This is like, it's such a good food wine because of the acid and because of all the structure in this one. I think it's super easy to pair. Oh, see, wasn't I right in calling on Carrie? You know, no, Carrie used the term phenolic, which is just brilliant because that's that's the perception of tannin. You know, it's um it's now the fashion for a lot of white wine producers, right, Adam, to do skin contact mm -hmm. with, uh, white wine production where you get like a white wine bitterness and we're getting it in this um, in the cider. I just think oh. this would be a great cider uh, to start out as an aperitif, you know, and trump through uh, dinner and end up with something sweet, which we are about to enjoy, I think. Hold yes, the boat. Um, so now for this is completely the, different. This is something completely now this is the little silly picture that I took and I was really excited to see this. What are we staring at? So that's our um, wash basin for our apples and also the elevator and crusher. So that's the uh, crushes the apples uh, into pomace, which then go into the press, which you'll see in this uh, video. And this actually has audio as well. And Madeline's big accomplishment was being able to copy it. So <laughs> that you all can see this it. is the Otterson apple that we uh, spoke about earlier in the, uh, the slideshow, um, the red fleshed apple. This is the red fleshed apple, right? Yes, yes. yes. You can see. see it here. Blood red. Blood red. And it's, it's interesting, these red flesh varieties share a lot of the same um, characteristics as red fleshed grapes. Hold so tight, just some... for a moment, Adam, because I don't know if they can hear you over this. Oh. Hold tight, and then you can explain to us what we're looking at. Wow, there it is, red juice. How cool is that? Go ahead, you were saying it's much like- Looks like beet juice. Yeah, it, it does. So, so these different varieties, Otterson's got a lot of color, but just like grapes, the color is more or less stable in different varieties. Um, Pinot Noir is notorious for having unstable color. Um, and you can press after fermentation, you have this black wine and a week later, it's not so darkly colored um, because the, the color compounds just aren't stable and they tend to, to drop out. Same with apples. Fortunately, Otterson has very stable color. Um, it contributes a lot to the color. Um, the other varieties, um, if we didn't have the Otterson, you may not see it as rosé. Um, there's just a very slight pink hue to them. But the Otterson really gives it a lot of the, the color and the character um, you know, that, that enables us to make a, a full rosé. Well, it's not uncommon for other people who are making rosé cider to be using an additive, correct? Uh, correct? To color the cider, but yours is completely natural, yay. Now, this yeah. is something uh, very special that we're about to, and I love this. All of you look absurdly cheerful, like you've been <laughs> Smile. Not after the, the eighth hour, but yeah, <laughs> no. beginning. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, we're at 9% alcohol and what a significant amount of residual sugar on, uh, on this puppy. So um, tell us how you make this because there are different ways of making ice cider, right, Adam? Uh, there are. And, and first I like to point out, 
we talked about the Kingston or the, the old world and the residual sugar in that one. So we're at, you know, 0.1, 0.2%. Uh, multiply that um, times Holy moly, 137 grams per liter? 137 grams. Oh. We're going from two grams per liter to 137 <laughs> grams per liter. Of sugar. Well, of sugar. Left. You know what? That's the acidity the is staggering because you don't yes. feel the wine, the cider is that sweet. It's it's not cloying at all. You get the sweetness up front, you know, and all those great honeyed components to it. Um, but it finishes pretty bright. Um, so you know, the, there, there are different ways to produce ice cider. Um, and you know, you can leave the apples on the tree. You know, once they're frozen, press them, which is basically, at least in our situation, impossible. Just getting mm -hmm. to them, keeping them frozen through, through the process, because we got to put them through the grinder. And the heat generated by that alone, they're not frozen anymore. So we've opted for what's called a cryo concentration. So we press the juice and then freeze it. And then we pull it out of the freezer and once it starts to thaw, the heavier juice settles out and the water floats on the top. So then I can draw from the bottom of the container and pull exactly what I want out of there um, uh, to be able to produce this. And it's just like, you know, it's just like ice wine. It well, it's, it's not unlike what Randall Graham did when he made icebox wine. Right. Uh, yeah, right. The, the, the Van Glossier that he yes, was doing. Yes, the Van de Glossier, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, and he was lauded for that. So here you are doing uh, something similar to make um, ice cider. So yep. the sugar it, is natural and from the apples. And the, right. um, uh, the acidity is natural. And uh, from the, basically, I'm just getting rid of the water. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a way to, to be able to separate the, tr the two and give me complete control on exactly, you know, what I'm pulling out of that, um, that juice. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't need to pull more than I, than I have to. And I just get the most concentrated, the most flavorful. And, I'm only really sorry I'm not working dining rooms anymore because I'd like to float around at the end of the night and just pour everyone a splash of this stuff, right? Because uh, uh -huh. uh, historically, Americans don't order dessert wine, you know? So when I was working the floor for, you know, a century, I would make it a mission in life to just simply give away slightly sweet wines, uh, which always put a smile on everyone's face. And then We've got a techno question from Aaron who would like to know what is your approximate starting gravity or bricks on the ice cider? Um, about 30 bricks. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, it'll vary a little bit, um, but that's kind of the, the ballpark that'll get me the, the alcohols and the sugars I want. Now this, the addition, you're making some ciders you, you use can't it all of a sudden I lost the audio. Uh oh, can you hear me? I mean, I got it not on the speaker. Okay, who uh, is everyone having a hard time with audio? Can you hear me? I wonder why it's not. we're good. Okay, cool. Um, in addition to uh, you know, the, the dry and sweet ciders, ice ciders, single varietal ciders, mixed ciders. You also make specialty ciders. You didn't you just make some um, uh, some flavored ciders? And I'm wondering if you're still making hop ciders and barrel aged ciders. Tastes really good. Um, so, well, well yeah. we we haven't done a hop cider again. We did one in the initial run, um, and we haven't done one since. the uh, the The hop cider that we produced, we were growing hops at the time. And we used hops from the farm. Um, the hops have been pulled out. So we don't have hops on the farm to make our cider. And because we're trying to keep everything completely estate, um, we haven't gone down that path. We've done a couple of barrel aged ciders and I'm planning on doing something of the sort this year, um, doing another one. So that's a, you know, on again, off again 
kind of yeah. thing. Um, and yeah, we're doing flavored ciders because they're fun. Um, <laughs> people like them. And, um, you know. And frankly, if you folks visit the, um, the, the tasting room, I was shocked at the wide range of things that you were pouring, uh, both as tastes and flights, which was really cool. So George, since this is an, an unbelievably hip picture of you, what are, yeah. looking, <laughs> what are we looking at here? What is Pomo? Uh, so Pomo is a traditional uh, beverage from uh, Northern Northwest France, uh, Brittany, Normandy. Um, so it's apple brandy with fresh juice. So ours is our <laughs> apple brandy with, so it's three parts fresh apple juice, one part brandy. Um, it's about 70%. Um, it's really great. Uh, no, it's better than that. Unlike Pinot de Noir uh, in France, it's where you spectacular. Have, uh, it's spectacular. Yeah, we yeah. have unfermented, uh, unfermented grape juice added to mm -hmm. cognac, you know, to make yeah. uh, Pinot de Chiron. So this is a similar process. And what's so cool about this stuff is that you have that freshness of the the juice. Mm -hmm. I would well imagine. And I was asking yeah. Adam, you were telling me where the apple brandy comes from. Um, so it, it, they're apples off of our property, and I do a fermentation specifically for distillation. So I handle it a little bit differently. The varieties that go into it are, are, are definitely different. Maybe I'll just um, put them on a leash and let them out in the front. Uh oh, there's, so whoever's got the doggy needs to mute because we're getting the doggy story. Um, oh, and, Adam. and then we, we just recently got our uh, distilling permit, but we don't have a still yet. So. Um, I sent the um, the low wine, the low cider, over to Black Star Farms, who has a long history of producing very high quality fruit brandies, um, and they distilled to our specifications. Then brought it back, and then we aged it and and produced the pomo from there. Cool. Uh, and so the alcohol on that, I can see it. It's like seventeen percent, right? Seventeen. Uh, yeah. Seventeen. Yep. Uh, and then um, I love showing this picture because these morels are from your farm, correct? Yes. Oh, yes. And we're uh, not talking about like a couple of them. You have significant uh, morel production. I mean, if you can find them before the deer get them. Yes. Yeah. It's, morels uh, are very, they like old orchards or just anywhere where um, wooded, area. wooded areas where trees have been. Um, and we have a lot of trees. <laughs> Uh, do you keep them not. and cook them, or do you sell them to restaurants? Uh, keep them. Yeah. Keep them. <laughs> George eats them all. George eats them all. Unfortunately, yeah, I pick them all and don't tell anybody, and yeah. then I take them all. <laughs> yeah. 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 And lots of rain. I'm, 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 right? I'm the morale troll. Yeah. yeah. Morale troll. Excellent. That's a t-shirt, yeah. man. So I, I right? have a technical question I forgot to ask you guys. Your ciders are, correct me if I'm wrong, except for the ice cider, they're all carbonated. Is that correct? Um, and do you add CO2 or how do you do that? Um, yeah, currently we've done some, some non-carbonated ciders in the past and we, we may again, um, but you're correct. Currently everything's carbonated except for um, the, the ice cider. Um, we, Carbonate using an inline carbonator. Um, we <laughs> carbonate into what's called a bright tank. It's a pressurized tank. Um, something that you can, you know, build well, the pressure. Like, 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 can... like the Charmat tank. Where it's exactly. Same, same idea. The, the glory of this inline carbonator is that it allows me to dial in um, very, very specifically the amount of carbonation. And also the process by which it carbonates, um, it infuses it with these just tiny little bubbles. The bubble size um, after uh, using this inline carbonator, they're just, they're great. They're just tiny frothy bubbles, mm -hmm. which I think, you know, does a lot for, for the texture. You know, um, I didn't well. even notice that until you're talking about it, but the carbonation is very integrated, very subtle. You don't feel like yeah. bubbles, you know. Mike asked a killer question, uh, Mike Pfeiffer, how long do the apple trees produce fruit similar to wine vines or different you, or until you have to replant them? Fabulous question. I had to end with this picture just because you're just too charming for words here. You know? <laughs> um, we can answer them. 
the, the question. So yeah. the high density, the dwarf apple trees, typically 20, 25 years, 20, 25 years. But um, we don't really, you know, honestly, we don't know. Maybe we can push that. The, the thing is, you don't want to have biannual bearing, which is where they bear really heavily one year and then they don't bear the next year. And that tends to happen when you get older trees. So, um, but one of the reasons why people say 20 years too is because consumer preferences change. keep changing. Right. So that's more for the fresh market. Right. So who knows? These who knows? last 30, 40 years. Right. The cider apples for sure. Yeah. Who knows? They, they could last longer. It's just, yeah. Uh, that 20, 25 year. Um, Hi, P. <laughs> um, I wanted to, uh, before I forget, and then we can hang for a little while longer in case anybody has any questions. Oh, very Marshall. Marshall, you showed up. Yay, I always miss you when you're not here. Are these vegan friendly? Which, which I'll answer, um, and as well as the question right above it regarding filtration. Um, so um, I use filtration as necessary. Um, if, I, if, if the product has residual sugar, um, I typically sterile filter it and make sure that it's a stable product, you know, going to market. So it won't re-ferment. Right. Um, oh, the old world has less filtration, but it has some. Um, so it, it, it'll vary. Um, and as far as vegan goes, currently all of our ciders are vegan. Um, I'm not using any gelatin, which is the, the, the primary fining agent, a clarifying agent. Um, that um, makes them not vegan. Mm -hmm. um, no, I'm not going to say I won't use them in the future if I have to. If it's something that the cider absolutely has to have to make it better or make it stable, um, and it just will suffer if I don't, mm -hmm. um, I will consider it. Well, but you know, what you're work. saying is ultimately you're looking at the quality of the product. Yes, and you're going to do what's necessary for the end result. And I, I'm just interrupting long enough in case anybody's peeling off because we love diversity. Yes, we're going from cider to the Piedmont, where they also <laughs> make cider. Oh, and great um, this is a great producer. And I call them Piedmont's genius winery because they've been doing it for a long time. And they managed to ride the two horses of modern style and traditional style. And they have these two guys, Luca and Elena Corrado who you know, direct the winery have been unbelievable ambassadors for uh, Barolo in the United States for a couple of decades now. And we're gonna taste their Arnais and his father, Luca's father was single-handedly responsible for making sure that Arnais didn't become extinct. Um, and you know, this very delicate uh, perfumed um, uh, white wine, and then we're going to taste their Barbera Dasti. And I insisted on this because Barbera is like widely misunderstood, uh, but uh, unbelievably good All right. uh, buy. Boy. And then uh, Barolo, Castiglione Barolo. So we're, we're doing this in collaboration with our Chicago store too. So we're going to have both Chicago, our four Michigan stores, and both Luca and Elena on, on Friday, October 8th. Why 4 p.m., Madeline? because it's their 10 p.m. It may even be their 11 p.m. because they're inching further east. I know Paris would be six hours. I'm not sure where um, if the Lange is six or seven hours. So I hope you join us in a couple of weeks for that. And I didn't mean to interrupt, but um, we have a wine question. Our, uh, in 2K makes a Riesling. Tell us about that uh, little Riesling that you make, Adam. Uh, yeah, yes, we do make a Riesling, um, and thanks for asking. Um, it's a great variety for, for this part of the world. I think in northern Michigan is, is one of the best Riesling spots on the planet. Um, we've currently got our 17 vintage out, which is drinking gloriously. Um, won some great awards. We've got some more coming down the road. We do a bubbly Riesling, so it's not as um, carbonated as a, a champagne, um, but, um, you know, good clear bubbles and, you know, fruitier style. Um, and we're also doing, we're going to be releasing uh, Pinot Grigio coming up from, from last year and got some, some reds in the ground and 
be making those for the first time this year. Um, game A and Pinot Noir, and we have a Pinot Noir that we're about to release. Now you got the Pinot from uh, another farm, correct? But the, the, in the glass, it's just beautiful. I mean, there's no dishonor. We're talking about a growing region the size of a postage stamp if you start <laughs> thinking of, you know, France. So, yeah, yeah. Well, we, you know, we decided to plant some reds and I wanted to kind of get some reds into the pipeline and get people used to the idea. Um, so I thought who better to turn to to buy Pinot Noir from than Charlie Edson at Bel Lago. Uh, drum roll, is, the man who for is Pinot Noir. Probably right? the best Pinot Noir grower in the region. Um, so provided me with some great fruit and I think the wine turned out pretty good. I think it turned out pretty good too. And I don't work for you, you know, <laughs> so I get to say that, but I, listen, this was really special, you know, thank you for um, Max, George and Adam for thank putting you. up with thank all you. my pesky requests. Uh, but anyone want to ask a question or weigh in uh, with any comments before we wrap it up? But it was really illuminating for me. And it, it is, um, I think, given us all a deep respect for, um, for what you're doing. It's, uh, you know, to Adam's point, how often do you walk through a vineyard and taste 30 different grape varieties within five minutes of each other? And the answer is never, unless it's an experimental vineyard, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this was, um, this was a lot of fun. Uh, are your wines available down here in Ann Arbor? And I think Mike Pfeiffer can uh, speak they to are. Mm -hmm. the Mike. They are. The Pomo and the Riesling are available in Ann Arbor. Okay. Um, before, before we go, I would, I would invite, uh, not invite, but recommend to anybody, if you're up in Little and to visit the property, visit the tasting room. It's a fantastic place. Um, Everybody there is fantastic in terms of um, their their knowledge um, and 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 you know what they do and what you all do. So Carrie Ann and I had a great time last year, and uh, I would I would highly recommend a visit if you're in. Thank, you. Thank you. Oh, another thing I want to mention: if you look on the cans, it'll tell you like vegan, gluten free, um, all that stuff. So grown in Michigan, grown in Michigan, non GMO. Um, so I and also you know go ahead. Uh, one plug for Plum Market. So the Pomo uh, is only available in our taste room and at the and four Plum Markets in Michigan as well. So oh, very so exclusive. We exclusive. have one of these guys to thank for that. Um, <laughs> well, you know what? Your bar has been set pretty high. Uh, I personally am going to look forward to um, an even more uh, sophisticated lineup of ciders and i think you're going to help put uh, michigan on the outstate map if you choose so, we believe, yeah. so thank you very much for your company for uh sharing all this info and most importantly for these absolutely delicious ciders cheers thank, thank you to everyone uh, stay healthy stay safe um you know and here we are still wearing masks indoors and we're moving into winter, but healthy and safe is the way to go. We can still have fun with each other. Yes. We have, by the way, completely re renovated the, um, the uh, um, wine bar areas at our West Bloomfield store and Ann Arbor West, which are soon to be uh, revealed and hopefully October, November, we can start doing some uh, in-person events because this is terrific, but there's something we'll be there. We'll be there. person that is special. Cheers to everyone. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Madeline, and Thank the, you, Madeline. the whole Plum Market team. Thank you. Yep. Thank you.